At one point, Hunter Mahan was the only player to make every tour championship during the FedEx Cup era. As soon as he turned pro from the mid-2000s to the mid-2010s, he was a consistent force on tour, racking up half a dozen wins and rising to as high as fourth in the world rankings. The only thing missing was a major win, and it seemed it was only a matter of time before he got one. However, in the past five seasons, his game and consistency has dropped off significantly, and this once almost guarantee has been put in doubt. Hello everyone, it's your knock Peter Mata, and today we're going to talk about what happened to Hunter Mahan. Born in Orange, California, to Sydney and Monty Mahan, Hunter first actually excelled in soccer and karate before being introduced to golf by his father. Unlike most golfers, golf came easy for Hunter, as he even said once, quote, I was blessed with a naturally smooth golf swing. The family moved to McKinney, Texas, and that's where Hunter grew up and where his game began to truly blossom. He enjoyed a long list of junior accomplishments on the AJGA Tour, and even at this point, Hunter described his game as, quote, not flashy, but consistent. With this type of game, Hunter racked up three Rolex Junior All-American awards and the 1999 Rolex Junior Player of the Year. On a side note, growing up, Hunter developed a relationship with his closest friend on tour, Sean O'Hare. Hunter said on the relationship, quote, for myself and Sean, we kind of looked back to when we were 12 years old, playing, meeting each other, playing against one another, and seeing where we are today, and see what we are in our lives. It's just kind of neat to see how the progression in our life kind of started when we were kids, and where it is now. Anyways, with Hunter's game producing, he received a lot of offers to play college golf. He first played at USC for a year, but eventually transferred to Oklahoma State, and there he continued to produce for the school and individually. He was a two-time Big 12 Conference Player of the Year and a two-time First Team All-American. He was also the runner-up to Ricky Barnes at the US Amateur in 2002. And in 2003, he won the Haskins Award for Outstanding Collegiate Golfer and was co-winner of the Ben Hogan Award. With these great amateur results, Hunter decided to turn pro in 2003 and he received the maximum seven sponsor exemptions to get his career going. He had mixed results in the starts, but at the end of the year, he was able to go through Q School and earn his card for the 2004 season. During that season, as one of the youngest players on tour at 21, he again had mixed results. He did find a rhythm late in the summer though and notched three top tens, including a playoff runner-up in the Reno Tahoe Open. This helped him secure his card for the 2005 season. Unfortunately, in the 2005 season, he did struggle and had to try to regain his card for 2006 at Q School. To his credit though, he was able to do just that. This appeared to be a very significant turn for Hunter as for the next 10 years, he continued to develop his game and blossom into a top player. In 2006, he had a stable season, highlighted by a runner-up finish at what is now known as the Travelers Championship. He was able to retain his car for 2007, and this runner-up finish provided a perfect foreshadowing for the following season. In that 2007 season, which was the maiden year for the FedEx Cup playoffs, Hunter had a great season that was highlighted by, you guessed it, his maiden win at the Travelers Championship. He beat Jay Williamson in a playoff with an epic clutch shot to close it out, and this catapulted him into a wonderful streak of consistent play. During that season, for the first time, he made it to the Tour Championship and earned his way onto Team USA for the President's Cup. He made this a habit as he made the next seven Tour Championships and six out of the next seven team events. In 2008 and 2009, he didn't win, but had very consistent seasons highlighted by two runner-ups. He was also right there in contention late in the game during the 2009 US Open. In total, he had 29 top 25s, including 11 top 10s during these two years. In 2010, he had a great year with his first two win season. He picked up a one-stroke victory over Ricky Fowler at the Waste Management Phoenix Open 
and a two-stroke victory at the WGC Bridgestone Invitational over Ryan Palmer. While his reputation as a clutch player did take a hit after his debacle at that year's Ryder Cup, Hunter still proved that he was a budding PGA Tour star. In 2011, he had another incredibly consistent season. This was the year that the interesting golf boys assembled, and it was also the year that Hunter was in a playoff against Bill Haas in the Tour Championship. The stakes of this playoff was extremely hefty, as the winner of it not only won the tournament, but also the season-long FedEx Cup, along with the money and accolades that come with it. Unfortunately, despite Hunter's great efforts, Bill Haas eventually beat him out after his memorable water shot. While this certainly was a disappointing winless season for Hunter, he still built off it and had arguably his best year on tour in 2012. During said year, he had his second two-win season. The first was arguably his best one as he defeated then world number one Roy McIlroy in the final match of the WGC Accenture Match Play Championship. A couple months later, he picked up his second win that year at the Shell Houston Open. After this win, he rose to his highest world ranking of fourth, which also made him the highest ranking American then. Other than that, he racked up 10 top 25s, which included three top 10s. Interestingly enough, that was the one year during this stretch that he didn't make Team USA for a team event. Missing that year's Ryder Cup made him feel, quote, empty, especially after we saw the results of that event. Despite the snub, after the 2012 season, it was clear Hunter was a top player who had the talent and the production to prove it. He was in that category of players that you would say is ready to win a major championship to take his career to the next level. In 2013, he damn near did just that. In the US Open that year, he was right there with the chance to win with four holes to play. Unfortunately, he went four over in those last four holes and finished in a tie for fourth. This was also the season that Hunter withdrew from the RBC Canadian Open, despite being the 36 hole leader. While controversial, it was for a good reason, as he was able to make it back home to see the birth of his first child, Zoe. Even though Hunter didn't win that season, it didn't cost him all too much, as once again he had great consistency throughout the whole year. In total, he racked up 16 top 25s, including 5 top 10s and a runner-up finish. And with all that, he was able to make it back to the Team USA for the President Cup that year. In 2014, he did notch his 6 PJ Tour win at the Barclays, holding off Stuart Appleby, Jason Day, and Cameron Tringali for a two-stroke win. This along with his 8 top 25s and 5 top 10s helped him secure a final captain's pick for Tom Watson's Team USA that year. Say again, this marked his 8th straight Tour Championship, which made him the only player at the time to have made it that far that many times since the FedEx Cup era began. He also made 7 out of 8 Team USA events, where he compiled a 14, 11, and 5 record. Really just an amazing amount of consistency over this time, which makes it even more crazy to see his results for the following years. Now 2015 was not the worst year ever, but it was subpar for Hunter. He made it to the playoffs, but did not make it to a tour championship for the very first time. And to that point, he did not earn his way onto Team USA for that year's President's Cup. It's in the seasons from 2016 until now that has a lot of people, including Hunter, scratching their heads. In 94 events during this time, he's only made 43 cuts and tallied a whopping total of 9 top 25s and just 1 top 10. He has not qualified for the FedEx Cup playoffs since 2015 and also has not played on any team events since that time. From 2017 to 2019, he was even forced to go to the Web.com Tour Finals to try to retain his card. To his credit, in 2017 and 2018, he was able to do just that. Unfortunately, in 2019, he was not able to do the same. Currently, for the 2020 season, he's had to rely on being a past champion and on conditional status. So far in this season, he's not played well at all. He's not even been able to reach the weekend in each of his five events that he's played. And as of this video, 
He's ranked 836th in the world. So this brings us to the question for this video. What has happened to Hunter Mayhem? Well, it's been a combination of things. But let's start with his golf game first. One thing Hunter could always hang his hat on was his ball striking. And during his good seasons, he was consistently in the top 40 in strokes gained off the tee and strokes gained tee to green. Even during his down years, he's been solid in terms of strokes gained off the tee. So it's safe to say driving is not the issue. Interesting enough, Hunter's putting stat wise is also pretty solid. So it's really come down to the fact that his around the green play, i.e. chipping, pitching, and bunker play has never really been up to par. And then judging from his strokes gain approach to the green stats from the past five seasons, it's clear that his loss of ball striking mixed with his already poor wedge play has led to some problems. To comment on his struggles, Hunter said, quote, where my game was, it was something that I've never experienced before. I'd never been through such a low peak where you're trying to find yourself again. Every day the swing felt different and I didn't know what I was doing. No one wants to do that and not have a silver lining. I had no confidence in how to play golf and that's when you pick up and do something else. Indeed, with these struggles continuing, he ended up leaving his longtime swing coach, Sean Foley, for Chris O'Connell. And together, Hunter and Chris have been trying to get back to fundamentals and create a more consistent swing. Another issue Hunter has been dealing with is a little bit more on the personal side. Katie Enlow, Hunter's sister-in-law, who originally introduced Hunter to his wife, Candy, passed away in July 2018 after battling leukemia. Additionally, there has been some unfortunate legal battles regarding Katie's death benefits that's been going on between Hunter's wife and mother-in-law against Katie's husband, Jason Inlow, who also happened to be the SMU golf coach. With this stress and strain put on the family, I'm sure it's been tough for Hunter to go about his business easily. He's also been reprioritizing his life anyway because of his own growing family, as he and Candy are welcoming their third child this year. Like I said, it's been a combination of things. While there's been a lot going on in his personal life, Hunter does seem to be in a good place mentally judging from the interviews lately. I personally think the biggest factor for his downfall has really just been a slump in his golf game. To me, while his swing is smooth and technically sound, I've always thought he was a bit too mechanical and relied too much on technique. In my opinion, I think Hunter just needs to let go and free his mind up more on the golf course. Obviously, this is easier said than done, but one thing I've consistently heard over the years about him is that he's one of the hardest workers on tour. And when I hear that, it tells me really it just comes down to trusting your training. And I think if he did that, even just a little bit, his career would get back on track. What do you guys think? Did you think Hunter Mahan was bound to be a major winner? Do you think he'll be able to find his game again and return to the top? Did you think his slump has been more of a matter of technique or his personal life? I appreciate y'all for watching. Please like, subscribe, and comment below. Your words mean something to me.